So I chose mitral regurgitation to talk about, and I will emphasize predominantly primary mitral regurgitation or degenerative MR, and go from the basics, from the biomechanics, to at least one of the latest advancements in uh, risk stratification and some of the questions, unanswered questions that we still have in a disease that's been with us since inception. Normally the mitral valve has to have a concave structure towards the atrium. And if it straightens out, you know that the mitral valve is tethered. And this happens both in ventricular mitral regurgitation in addition to atrial mitral regurgitation. And you could see the difference there. The atria are very large. Usually the substrate is atrial fibrillation or diastolic dysfunction of the ventricle, where the atria and the, and the annulus are, are so enlarged. Basically what we did is use the best imaging modality, time and space, and basically be able to measure strain and have a heat map of strain. And these are 3D modeling of a normal and abnormal valve. And this is tracking the mitral valve in systole, and this is a mitral valve prolapse, so you could measure the formation of the mitral valve and, and plot it in 3D dimension. In mitral regurgitation, as opposed to normal, you have much more strain, much more deformation of the valve. And again, I didn't mention to you, we can't measure st strain of the chordae themselves, which could be the problem down the line. And we were wondering whether this increase in strain was actually just related to the severity of regurgitation. So we were straining to look for mitral valve prolapse without regurgitation. And indeed, in the middle, mitral valve prolapse without regurgitation has increased strain and increased deformation. Now, for every one of you, including our surgeons, you have to have a methodical approach to evaluate these lesions. And the methodical approach has to be anatomy, color flow, which is your first screener, pulse Doppler and CW, not to ask our surgeons to look at pulse Doppler and CW as much, but beware of color Doppler, which can be misleading, very helpful, but misleading. And if you want to remember one thing for color Doppler, it is not a volumetric approach, it's a velocity approach. So it's great as telling us where is the jet going, but for evaluation of severity, you have to take a look at the three components of the jet, which is convergence of flow into the atrium, towards the atrium, the vena contracta, which is the smallest area, and the regurgitant area, which can be influenced by direction, by other things. So it is not a volume. So, and, and that's why we have to take a look at these three components because it can be misleading. You hear about PISA and flow convergence. It is an important parameter but not without its issues. So we keep that in mind because it tells us the more you see of this flow convergence in the ventricle going into the atrium, the more severe the regurgitation is. And most of you know that above 0.4 centimeters squared, if you see this number, usually it's severe. You start some significance above 0.3 centimeters squared. And the same cutoffs are for both primary and secondary mitral regurgitation, regurgitant volume greater than 60 ml. Significant prognostic implications for effective regurgitant orifice area and regurgitant volume. But these are my summary slide for effective regurgitant orifice area and PISA. Always use it semi-quantitatively because it helps you. It has issues. There's no question about it. So you may not be able to to measure it, measure the numbers through it in, at times, very eccentric jets or if you have multiple of them, but keep that in mind. This box is very important for people who are involved in this phase. You cannot use color Doppler measures of severity. Neither the area, nor vena contracta, nor flow conversions, nor effective regurgitant orifice area. Because in your mind, if you have non-holocystotic mitral regurgitation, it's almost half of what you think. Almost half of what you think. The only thing that you could do is measure a regurgitant volume where you use this tiny portion of the regurgitation and then regurgitant volume is almost adjusted by half. This is my conclusion slide regarding MR and echo.
they are complementary. Variability in MR, we know it is less. Clinically significant discordance between of them is infrequent, 10 to 50%, but not negligible either. <coughs> Knowledge of these modality is important, and if you have a discrepancy, you really need to go back. From my uh, recommendations to you, and this is not in the guidelines, if you are doing a transthoracic examination and you need more information, what would tilt you to transesophageal echocardiography is knowing the mechanism, concomitant atrial fibrillation, if I have a susceptibility artifact, if I have prosthetic valves are needed at the bedside, what favors MRI is quantitation. Certainly in secondary MR, if I'm looking for viability and scarring, I think that's going to be important. But the big issue is quantitation with cardiac MRI. I will highlight one of the studies that, uh, that uh, uh, in our lab, uh, Dr. Sachin Goel and uh, many of his postdocs are, are really working on a very large series here looking at various ways of trying to predict outcome and see feasibility and if it's not feasible what it is. But I like this study very much, which is submitted and I think presented in an oral form at the national meeting, is that you could take a look at pulmonary veins right here, just like I showed you. But also you can take a look at hemodynamics. What are you left with in the left atrium? If the left atrial pressure is greater than 15, uh, you may still be in trouble from a prognosis point of view. And obviously, MR reduction. So MR reduction, pulmonary veins improvement, in addition to a left atrial pressure that you're left with. And this is in the catheterization laboratory while the interventionalist and the imagers are, are doing such.